Yesterday I posted another translation to a portion of that French documentary on otaku culture in mid-90s Japan. And I've done that a few times. Uh, I looked at a Street Fighter tournament. I did the inside Nintendo portion of the movie. And now I did the inside Sega portion of the movie, which I didn't even realize existed. I had watched this DVD up until I got to the Nintendo section. And I said, well, boy, that's great. Let me... Uh, throw that on YouTube and translate it because I didn't find it anywhere else. I picked up this DVD in a used uh, game slash music slash movie store uh, in Frankfurt a number of years ago. So uh, I was surprised to see that Sega got its own portion of the movie and it's kind of interesting how Sega was presented. There was a couple of things that stood out to me so I just I felt the need to come on and talk about them. Uh, number one, the beginning of the clip, you see the JAMA convention, the Japanese Arcade Manufacturers Convention, from what looks to me to be 1994 or 1995, judging by the games. And then the first thought, uh, looking at that footage, was how amazing it would have been to be there and see things like Daytona USA and Virtua Fighter and King of the Fighters 95, um, and just all the great footage that they, they showed there. Um, at that time, you know, to, to think that you would be on the cutting edge, you know, I think a lot of us now have played all these games uh, on consoles, in emulation, but to see all of them there, and just the beauty of those physical machines, the incredible cabinets that they showed, um, it was, uh, I thought, pretty amazing, extremely nostalgic, and... and doesn't have anything to do with Sega necessarily, but I thought it was good uh, footage, you know, to just uh, include in the documentary to really show, you know, the cutting-edge technology that was available in Japan relevant to the rest of the world. And, of course, we had to wait on a lot of those arcade games. But it's interesting. Interesting to see how Sega was presented. First of all, you know, they start off, I guess this was in the midst of the console war, so you have the CEO of Sega saying basically... You know, look, uh, I read a report that Nintendo's the world leader, but wait, you know, we are beating them in Europe, we're beating them in North America. Um, but even more instructive was when they interviewed that developer and kind of how he presented the future of video games and Sega's role in that future. This was well within the period where Sega was pushing FMV games pretty hard. And we saw an FMV game that I, I don't know what it is. I, didn't, I don't know that it existed, but this kind of Michael Jackson space pirate game. And it's funny, you know, he talked about the developers at Sega not being like the other video game developers, not being otaku, you know, extreme obsessive cultural enthusiasts, you know, who just programmed things on computers, that they were creating these multimedia games that no other company could create. Um... And then, of course, you see the Michael Jackson, look like a Michael Jackson version of Sword Shark, and you just kind of see how flawed, in retrospect, Sega's logic was. On the other hand, what I thought was also pretty interesting about that whole um, self-presentation of Sega as a company was how the discourse of innovation very rarely changes. I mean, we still hear this today, how, you know, immersive, massively multiplayer games, cinematic experiences, how this is somehow going to take storytelling forward. And I think it's a warning, at least what we saw in the movie, was how uh, a lot of these supposed innovations actually take away from gameplay. Although I will have to say, of all the FMV games, the kind of cockpit thing that they were showing, which again, that could have been a prototype, I don't recall ever seeing it, uh, was probably the most extreme FMV game uh, ever created. And then the last point that was interesting, and I, I didn't know whether to include this or not in my editing of the original video, was... Um, you know, that, that that segment on Sega ends uh, with the line, something to the effect of, otaku have no purpose in life. And the rest of the movie, kind of interestingly, focused on how this form of cultural consumption in Japan, that's what otakuism is, you know, enthusiastic, uh, obsessive hyper-consumption, was uh, in a way unhealthy. They look at these kids who were rapping, and, and you know, which was awful, so I didn't include that. They sort of talk about, you know, what this means for the for the future of Japan now that they've reached, at least at that point, kind of the pinnacle of their wealth. Uh, people didn't have anything to do, so they turned to this kind of um, 
technology culture. And it was funny to see it from that European perspective, looking at the Japanese as, as odd. Uh, somehow all of this technology is, in a sense, uh, skewing what it means to be human. So that last little clip kind of focused uh, the attention, I think, on the European uh, elitism that I think was the undercurrent of this film. Again, I have the German version. I don't speak Japanese. I don't speak French. It kind of be interesting to see if someone watches who is a native Japanese speaker, you know, if the interviews and the things that were said specifically at the end really did translate to the otaku have no purpose in life. Uh, but it's it's an interesting film, and I don't know if it's there's any way to watch it other than to just, you know, find it like I did floating around uh, in a shop overseas. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if people are interested on the sort of cultural bit about what it means or what it meant back then to be a technology enthusiast or an otaku, I can, uh, I can translate those as well. But for me, anyway, the takeaway point here and why I was just, you know, lucky to have found this, uh, this DVD is that, you know, like the Nintendo clip, like the Street Fighter convention clip, I think this captures... You know, that enthusiasm for gaming as it was developing, as it was becoming, you know, at that point a global phenomenon, but also the, the retro goodness, uh, to borrow a sort of pop term, uh, that you can get by, by watching it. You know, so many of, of those machines, and, and especially Sonic 2 playing in the background, you know, that was my youth, and I thought it was just cool to go back and, and see, you know, the places and see the offices and interview the people um, who created uh, so many of the games that I loved back when I was a kid.